Welcome back for another deep dive. And you know, today we're going to be uh, stepping back in time a little mm -hmm. bit to Elizabethan England. I love it. It's a world of poetry, you know, mysteries. Yes. All that good stuff. Absolutely. We're going to untangle a little bit of the enigma surrounding Francis Davison. Okay. A poet who has sparked some really fascinating theories. Yeah, this deep dive is particularly exciting because we're dealing with the question of authorship. Oh, yeah. And it kind of reaches right to the heart of English literature, you know? Yeah. Davison's poetry is undeniably good, mm. but we know very little about him biographically. Yeah. And this gap in our knowledge right. is really what makes him such a compelling figure. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. Yeah. We have... A Poetical Rhapsody, this collection of poems right. published by Davison in 1602. Yes. It's a real showcase of a lot of talent, mm -hmm. like sonnets, madrigals, pastorals, yeah. like you name it. You name it. He seems to have mastered it. He did. Yet we know nothing about the man. And that's where Bastion Conrad's research comes in. Okay. And his theory has really sent some shockwaves through the literary world. Okay. He suggests that Francis Davison might have been a pseudonym for Christopher Marlowe. Hold on. Yeah. Marlowe. As in? As in the playwright. Dr. Faustus? That's the one. The one who some scholars believe may have had a hand in Shakespeare's works. That's the one. Wow. And Conrad doesn't just throw this theory out there. Right. He backs it up with some pretty compelling evidence. Okay. So let's start with the poetical rhapsody itself. Right. The collection is dedicated to the Sydney family. Okay. And this is no random dedication. Right. The Sydneys were patrons of the arts. Mm -hmm. They were known for supporting promising writers, right. including Christopher Marlowe. So are you thinking that if Marlowe was living under a pseudonym, maybe because of some political or religious pressures at the time? Potentially. He's dedicating this work to these powerful allies, like mm -hmm. the Sydneys. Yes. Almost as like a subtle way of kind of like... A nod. Yeah, yes. signaling, Excellent. hey, I'm still here. Exactly. I'm still creating, right. even if I can't use my own name. It's like a hidden message. Yeah. It's a way of saying, I'm still here, I'm still creating, even if I can't use my own name. Wow. And Conrad's argument goes even beyond this one dedication. No. He digs into other works attributed to Davison, mm -hmm. like... Davison's Jester Grey Orm. Okay. And he finds links to Shakespeare's plays. Yeah. Specifically, The Comedy of Errors okay. and Love's Labor's Lost. So, wait, are you saying we might have Davison? Potentially Marlowe? Potentially Marlowe yeah. referencing Shakespeare. Are you referencing Shakespeare. Wow. Yeah. These are like layers of authorship and oh, influence oh, oh, oh. all kind of woven together. Exactly. So, is this practice of pseudonymity right. common back then? Like, it sounds kind of like something out of a spy novel. Yeah. I mean, Using pseudonyms in Elizabethan England wasn't as uncommon as you might think. Oh. Playwrights and poets, they often faced censorship, right. persecution for their work, yeah. especially if it touched on sensitive religious or political themes. That makes sense. So a pseudonym offered a kind of shield, right? a way to continue writing, mm. circulating their ideas okay. without risking imprisonment right. or even worse. That makes a lot of sense. So if Marlowe was living under a cloud of suspicion, right, using a fake name like Davison, it would have been pretty smart. It would have been a smart move, yeah. Yeah. It was a way to protect himself and right. to keep his work alive. And you gotta remember this was a time when the printing press was relatively new. Oh, that's right. And the power of words was immense. Yeah. So controlling what was published right. was a major concern for the authorities. Now, Conrad didn't stop at just analyzing the content and context of Davison's work. Right. He also delved into the realm of handwriting analysis. He did. He compared samples of Davison's penmanship to known examples of Marlowe's writing. Yeah. What did he find? So Conrad argues that there are striking similarities between the two. Okay. However, before we get too carried away, right. it's important to remember that handwriting analysis, yeah. especially when you're dealing with manuscripts from centuries ago, right. it's complex. Yeah. Handwriting can evolve over time. Right. And similarities don't necessarily equal definitive proof. So it's a piece of the puzzle, but not the whole picture. It's a clue. But this is where I think it gets really intriguing. Okay. Davison also wrote a work called The Mask of Proteus. Right. Now, for anyone who's dipped their toes into Greek mythology, yeah. Proteus is a shape-shifting sea god. 
a master of disguise. Yes. Could this be Davison giving us a hint? It's possible. At a hidden identity. It's a very astute observation. Yeah. The title itself seems to wink at the idea of concealed authorship. Right. And remember, Shakespeare also used the character of Proteus. Oh, that's right. In The Two Gentlemen of Verona. You yeah. Know, it just adds to this web of connections that we're starting to untangle. Shakespeare and Davison, right. or oh. rather Shakespeare and potentially Marlowe, potentially. playing with these similar themes yeah. of hidden identity. Absolutely. It really makes you wonder about the extent of their interaction and influence on one another. Right. We're starting to see a pattern emerge here. Yeah. A convergence of these thematic and biographical details that, right. when viewed together, yeah. make Conrad's theory even more compelling. So we've got the Sydney connection. Right. We've got possible allusions to Shakespeare's plays, uh -huh. intriguing handwriting analysis, yeah. and the symbolic use of the Proteus figure. It's starting to feel like a strong case for Marlowe being behind the Davison pseudonym. It really is. It is. But let's not jump to conclusions just yet. Let's not jump to conclusions. <laughs> we have a lot more ground to cover. We do. And we need to carefully consider all the evidence, all the evidence. before we form any definitive opinions. Is that there? All right, listeners, hold on tight, because we're about to plunge even deeper yes. into this world of Elizabethan intrigue. Deeper. We'll be right back to continue this deep dive into the mystery of Francis Davison. Welcome back. You know, we've been exploring this theory that poet Francis Davison may have actually been a pseudonym for Christopher Marlowe. Yeah, it really does feel like peeling back the layers of a literary onion. Right. Every new discovery reveals something yeah. unexpected. Absolutely. And just makes you question everything you thought you knew about this period. It does. So where do we go from here? Well... What other clues has Conrad uncovered in his research? One of the most thought-provoking pieces of evidence comes from a Davison poem Hi. called A Living Death. Interesting title. Yeah, and it's filled with this haunting imagery right. of isolation and concealment. Mm -hmm. There's these lines like, I dying live and cannot die, mm -hmm. enclosed wherein alive I buried lie. Wow, those lines are so evocative. It almost sounds like someone describing life in exile. Right forced to live under a false identity. Yeah. Could this be a veiled reference to Marlowe's supposed faked death? Possibly. And potential life on the run. It's the connection that Conrad makes. Okay. He argues that these lines could reflect Marlowe's own experience. Yeah. You know, a man living in the shadows, right. unable to openly claim his own work. Claim his work or even his own identity. Exactly. Wow. So this idea of a concealed identity, kind of like a candle and fly. Yes drawn to the flame, yes. even though they know it might lead to their destruction, mm -hmm. is that something that shows up in other works? Well, what's fascinating is that this candle and fly imagery yeah. also appears in works by other poets okay. who have been suspected of being Marlowe pseudonyms. Okay. Bartholomew Griffin, mm. Giles Fletcher, okay. and George Wither. Hold on. Yeah. Are you saying that there might be this whole network of poets connected to Marlowe? It's a very captivating idea. Yeah. Like a secret society of Elizabethan writers. Like a secret society. Oh. Of course we need to be cautious about jumping to conclusions. Of course, yeah. But the presence of similar imagery doesn't definitively prove a connection. Right. But it raises some questions yeah. about the possibility of shared ideas and influences. Shared ideas? Yeah, within this circle of writers. That's fascinating. It's like they're leaving these little breadcrumbs wow. and inviting us to follow their trail yeah. and uncover these hidden connections. Okay, this is getting really good. It is. Secret identities, yeah. hidden messages, right. and now potentially a whole group of poets linked to Marlowe. Mm. What else is there? There's more. Don't tell me that's all. In one of Davison's poems, okay. there's a line that seems like a straight-up confession yeah. to writing the famous Brutus monologue from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Davison writes that his muse indeed was inclined to write the famous acts of worthy brute. Are you serious? Yeah. He just admitted to writing part of Shakespeare. Whoa. That's huge. It's an incredibly bold statement. Yeah. And it's tempting to take it at face value, right. but as always, yeah. we have to be mindful of the context. Of course. Elizabethan writers, mm -hmm. they were masters of wordplay yeah. and illusion. Okay. So this line could be a playful boast. Okay. It could be a clever reference to a shared idea. Okay. 
or even a deliberate misdirection. Right, to kind of throw us off the scent. Exactly. What better way to conceal your true identity yeah. than to point the finger at someone else? To make us think it's Shakespeare exactly. when it was really him all along. Right. So I... even with this seeming confession, yes. we still can't be absolutely certain. We can't be certain. It's like we're trying to solve a puzzle. Yeah where the pieces keep changing shape. Right, and that's what makes this duck dive so fascinating. It really is. It challenges us to think critically, yeah. to weigh the evidence, mm -hmm. and to really grapple with the ambiguity yeah. inherent in literary history. Okay, so let's recap. Yeah. Conrad's argument hinges on these key points. Mm. The connection to the Sidney family, right. the thematic parallels with Shakespeare's work, uh -huh. The handwriting analysis, yeah. the recurring motifs, yeah. and now this potential confession right. within Davison's poetry. It's a lot to consider. It is. But are those enough to convince us that Davison was, in fact, Marlowe? It's a very compelling case. Yeah. It's certainly shaken up the world of literary scholarship. It has. But ultimately, it's yeah. up to each of us to decide how much weight we give to these pieces of evidence. Right. There's no smoking gun here. No. There's no definitive proof that settles the matter once and for all. So where does that leave us? I think we've gained a much deeper appreciation okay. for the complexities of authorship yeah. in the Elizabethan era. Right. We've seen how pseudonyms were used. Right. The potential for collaboration and shared ideas mm. and the challenges of trying to uncover the truth yeah. centuries later. Right. But more importantly, okay. this exploration has really highlighted a crucial point. What's that? That our understanding of history, mm -hmm. especially literary history, yeah. is constantly evolving. It's always changing. It's always changing. Yeah. Yeah. New discoveries, new interpretations, yeah. new perspectives can dramatically alter our understanding of the past. It's a great point. It reminds us to stay curious, to question what we think we know. Exactly. And be open to new possibilities. Absolutely. Because history isn't just this collection of facts. Right. It's a story that we're constantly retelling and reinterpreting. Precisely. And the story of Francis Davison yeah. is a perfect example of how one researcher yeah. with a fresh perspective mm. and a bit of detective work Yes. can challenge our assumptions right. and open up these entirely new avenues of exploration. Well, listeners, we've covered a lot of ground today. We have. But I feel like we've only scratched the surface, the surface. of this fascinating mystery. Yeah. What do you say? We take a moment to gather our thoughts okay. and then come back for one final reflection All right. on the enigma that is Francis mm -hmm. Davison. Okay, so we're back. And I got to say... My mind is still buzzing a little bit. Yeah. This whole deep dive into Francis Davison has been like a roller coaster ride. It has. It's just amazing how this simple question of who was this poet right. can lead us down such a fascinating and twisty path. It's a testament to the power of literature, yeah. you know, to spark our curiosity and to challenge our assumptions. And in the case of Davison, like these questions about authorship, you know, right. they really lead us right to the heart of Elizabeth and Nicola. To the heart of it. Which was a time of just incredible creativity, but also mm -hmm. some considerable danger. For sure. Especially for writers. Yeah. We're pushing the boundaries a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. So we've gone over a lot of intriguing evidence, you know. We have. The connection to the Sidney family. Yeah. The echoes of Shakespeare and Davison's work. Right. Handwriting analysis. Mm -hmm. These recurring motifs that keep popping up like little secret codes. Yes. And, of course, the seemingly bold confession about writing that Brutus speech. Yeah. It's a lot to consider. It is. But when you look at everything together, right. it paints a pretty compelling picture. Right. Yeah. Each piece of the puzzle on its own yeah. might not be conclusive. Right. But when you step back yeah. and you view it as a whole, yeah. it becomes really persuasive. Yeah, and Conrad's argument that Davison was just a mask for Marlowe. Right. A way for him to keep writing. You know, yeah. even though it was dangerous. Despite the risks. It starts to make a lot of sense. Like, it makes you wonder if there are even more right. like hidden connections out there just waiting to be found. Exactly. I mean, if Marlowe is living this double life, how many other works <laughs> might he have written under all these different names? That's a question that's haunted scholars for centuries. I bet. And the possibility, however small, yeah. is enough to fuel research for years to come. Of course. And ignite the imaginations of readers. For sure. So if someone's listening to this yeah. and wants to explore this further, yeah. where would you suggest they start? 
Well, I think the first step would be to dive into the works of Davison himself. Okay. Read a poetical rhapsody. Mm. Explore Davison's Jester Grey Orum. Okay. And just see if you can spot those subtle hints. Right. The echoes of Marlowe and Shakespeare. That we've been talking about. That we've been talking about. And then, you know, maybe branch out to the works of those other poets. Yeah. Bartholomew Griffin, Giles Fletcher, George Wither. Right. Look for those recurring themes. The stylistic similarities, the hidden connections. Yeah, like a literary treasure hunt. It is. It is. But even if you don't discover anything, you know, it's right. earth shattering. Yeah. The journey itself is going to be amazing. Absolutely. You're going to be immersed in the world of Elizabethan poetry. Yes. Beautiful language, complex ideas. It's a rewarding experience. Yeah. For sure. So this deep dive, it's just the beginning, right? It is. The real adventure starts yeah. when you open those books. Right. Engage with the text. Yeah. And come to your own conclusions. I love that we started this deep dive with a really simple question. We did. Who was Francis Davison? Yeah. And we might not have a definitive answer. Right. But we've uncovered we have. so many fascinating possibilities. Yeah, and explored this shadowy world now, of Elizabethan pseudonyms. Yeah, the complexities of authorship and the enduring power of literature. Absolutely. To both challenge and inspire. For sure. So I think the most important lesson yeah. we can take away from all this What's that? It's just to always be open-minded. Open-minded. And to never stop inquiring because history is not fixed. It's not set in stone. It's a constantly evolving narrative. Yes. Shaped by new discoveries and interpretations. Right. So don't be afraid to question what you think you know. I love it. Embrace the mystery. Yeah. Explore the possibilities. It's those pages turning. And who knows, maybe one of you listening yeah. will be the one to finally unlock the secrets of Francis Davison. That's right. And rewrite our understanding of Elizabethan literature. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey. And until next time. Until next time. Keep exploring. Keep questioning. Keep questioning. Keep diving deep.